Hi and welcome to this uh, DQF or Double Quantum Filtered Corsi NMR Spectroscopy Tutorial. When we look at phase sensitive Corsi NMR spectra we see that, as you can be seen here, that the diagonal peaks have this really large or broad in phase uh, double dispersion line shapes which can hinder any cross peaks that are close to the diagonal. If we look at the cross peaks themselves they seem to be a lot narrower and these have this antiphase double absorption line shape as shown here. Well, now what I've shown here is a is a rather simplified version of what you'd actually see just to illustrate a point really uh, so it's showing these this antiphase um, cross peaks and these in phase a rather broad diagonal peaks as can be seen here. Now what we see in the DQF course is that both the diagonal peaks and the cross peaks are now showing this antiphase uh, square array as you can see here and this dramatically cleans up the spectrum. Also notice that the diagonal peak from the singlet for that methyl, uh, the terminal methyl there has disappeared. So singlets will disappear because we're, we're filtering out the singlet peaks. We only see the double quantum and above transitions. So this can help in a number of ways. Firstly, the double dispersion line shape near the diagonals is gone, so it's a lot cleaner. So you can now see detail or couplings even, cross peaks near the diagonal. And secondly, if you've got a lot of um, methyl groups or you've got uh, a lot of singlets, for example from solvents, then all the T1 ringing noise that you can see in a 2D spectrum has been eliminated very easily using this method. The downfall of using DQF Corsi is that um, you sacrifice the sensitivity by about a half. Now one of the main things I use DQF Corsi for is actually to look at coupling constants um, for complex 1D spectra where you would not normally be able to measure coupling constants but the coupling constants can actually be measured by the, the difference between the uh, antiphase peaks that you see here on the spectra and I'll show you how to do that in a second. First of all though, I think it's important to actually understand um, the, the spin coupling of for example a two spin system, a very simple sp system we've got here and this will explain briefly as well what double quantum transitions mean as well and hopefully you'll get on to look at triple quantum transitions in later tutorials. So if we look at this very simple energy level diagram and imagine we've got two spins there, one's the nucleus of HA and one's the nucleus of HB. Now I've coloured them red and black just to make it easier to see. Now in the first transition shown here we have the A spin flipping so that goes from uh, up orientation to a down orientation and that is called the active spin because that's the one that's actually flipping. If you look at the B spin uh, just for this particular transition it doesn't change and that's called a passive spin. If you look on the other side now we can see that the A nucleus nucleus spin doesn't change so that is now the passive spin but the B spin has flipped so that is called the active spin or the active transition. If B does flip now you can see that both spins are now opposed to the direction of the magnetic field and this is the highest energy state for this two spin system. So in contrast to a singlet transition where you've just got um, a lower energy state and a higher energy state and there's one delta E if you will, now because HA is coupled to HB it has two different energy uh, transitions associated with it and similarly HB has two separate transitions associated with it. So HA will be seen as a doublet rather than a singlet and HB will now be seen as a doublet as well. Now there are also two other quantum transitions here which are actually disallowed uh, by the quantum mechanical selection rules. And the first one is this one shown here which is a zero order quantum transition and if you, you have to look carefully here but if you look at the HA spin that goes from, if we look at the left hand side going to the right hand side, that goes from a down to an up uh, spin state and also if we look at the B spin that goes from an up to a down spin state. This gives a, an overall zero quantum coherent transfer. This is called a cross relaxation pathway and we'll 
talk about that in, in another tutorial. The other one is the double quantum coherence transfer and that goes from, uh, if we look at the top, it goes from two downstairs uh, which are uh, opposed to the magnetic field, the higher energy states, go into the lower energy states where they both spin up and that's called a second order uh, coherence transfer. Now these double quantum transfer events are obviously important for double quantum filtered causes, as you can imagine. So we look at anything above the double quantum uh, transfer, if you will. So anything that can take part in uh, multiple quantum uh, coherence is what gets filtered out into the DQF cause here. It's also useful um, for NOE, this, this particular diagram, because it explains where the NOE effect comes from. We'll cover that in a, another tutorial. So let's have a look at the uh, NMR spectrum for a, uh, a three-spin system this time. This is uh, often referred to as a, an AMX system and the purple nomenclature, or purple notation, if you will. So we're looking at three um, first order couplings and basically that means that they're well separated from each other they will exist each one will exist as a, a set of double doublets and if you look to the um, normal cause it looks something like this and you'd have some fine structure in there what we're going to look at is this active and passive spin coupling within a dqf cause here now if you look at these diagrams here that I'm drawing, they, they are exaggerated, they are blown up, so it will be nice and tight, it'll be a lot tighter than it's seen there, but just just so we can see it in the diagram and explain it, I've, I've done it quite larger, if you will. So if you look, notice there's some sets of patterns here, and these patterns can actually be determined from a Pascal's triangle. I must also add that the diagonals would actually have some of this um, characteristic um, patterns as well. I've just uh, left them as black dots just for clarity really. So if we look at the cross peak in a bit more detail we can see that the active spin coupling because remember for this particular cross peak M is coupling to A but it also couples to X but this is not the cross peak for that this is the co for the cross peak for A so the active spin here is the A spin and that shows up as an antiphase uh, relationship so it's black and red. Now, but also present is the passive spin coupling as well. So X is also contributing to this splitting pattern. And that shows up as an in-phase coupling. So in this case, it's black and black. And that's what gives rise to these particular patterns. And the same can be applied for every other cross peak. So let's just have a look at the cross peaks in a little bit more detail. So let's, let's take them out of the spectrum, if you will. So we look at the AX coupling, the MX coupling, and the AM coupling. They'll have these kind of splitting patterns. So for the AX, because M is uh, just an observer, it's in phase. And the coupling constant for that is, is given as the distance between the two peaks. But for this cross peak, it's the AX spin we're interested in, the AX coupling constant. And that is given as the distance between the two antiphase peaks. And that will be the same in both directions. Be careful, the digitization resolution is different in the F1 and the F2 domain on your spectrum. So always go for the highest resolution one, which is usually the F2 domain. And of course, the exact same principles can be applied to the MX and the AM spin systems, or any spin system that you're actually interested in in the real world. So you're looking at this antiphase relationship, and that will tell you the active spin coupling. Uh, the in-phase relationship is a passive spin coupling. You're not interested in that really. You're just looking at the active spin coupling because that's the coupling constant you're actually interested in. And these are really useful if you've got um, a really crowded 1D spectrum and these cross peaks are taken to a, a part of the spectrum which is nice and clean. So you've got that extra resolution with a 2D spectrum that you didn't have in a 1D and you can get these coupling constants. But again, be careful, you must look at the highest resolution um, domain uh, when you're measuring these coupling constants, otherwise you can make grave errors, if you will. So just as a recap, the DQF COSI can make the COSI spectrum look incredibly clean and, and tidy, and it will enable you to look at cross peaks close to the diagonal because you get rid of all that dispersion, of course, by diagonal peaks. We've also looked at the energy level diagram for a two-spin system, which uh, introduces the concept of this double quantum coherence or, or these cross-relaxation pathways and single quantum 
coherence as well. We'll be doing a lot more about that later on. And also we've looked at, quite important for the DQF course, and which distinguishes it as a really useful technique, is the uh, ability to actually obtain coupling constants from the cross peaks themselves. And this is really important if you've got a really complex 1D spectrum because the 2D spectrum has got this higher resolution and you can get these uh, coupling constants out uh, quite readily. So that's it for now. If you've got any comments, please put them in the uh, comment section below. Uh, if you want to have a look at any worksheets, I'll keep uploading them to Epistemio. Uh, until next time, bye for now.